lot of peculiarities out there when it comes to elections and government and accountability. And Ken Block's here to talk to us about it tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Yes, former gubernatorial candidate and watchdog Ken Block is here for a comprehensive conversation on a story that ran on Eyewitness News last night regarding the Warwick Fire Department and perhaps some funny business going on with the way they manage their schedules. Uh, we've got Board of Elections technicalities. We've got a funky election in Pawtucket. We've got the desire for line item veto, so we'll try to cover a whole bunch of things with Ken this evening. In the meantime, I just wanted to mention, I am certain that we'll have a future program and hopefully have uh, this young woman uh, on as a guest. I was at this press conference at the American Civil Liberties Union Providence office today. Uh, There's a picture of the Calderon family, uh, Lillian and Luis, and uh, she is, after a month being detained, in Boston after she simply went to the ICE office in Johnston to further her documentation on being married to Luis, who was a citizen. She was detained by surprise, not much contact with anybody, and literally um, has been doing a month in jail. Uh, that's the press conference off my, uh, off my tweet, and here's just a small snippet of some of the experience she talked about. We had to sit through videos that had to do with, like, rape in prison. And all I could think of while I was there was, like, I can't believe I'm sitting through a video of, like, how to not get raped in prison. Because just the other day, I was picking up our daughter from school, and I was thinking, okay, you know, what are we going to do for winter so we can be cabin fever? She came here at three years of age with her dad, who was seeking asylum, who reportedly was a police officer. Uh, I believe in Colombia or Guatemala, um, and he was looking for asylum based on reportedly the bad guys looking for him. He was denied that asylum, but uh, and I'm not exactly sure where he is right now. Nobody will really tell me, but she has been here since three, just kind of doing her thing and interimly looking for uh, status and has not able, had not been able to uh, to seek it. But because she's on a low uh, ICE deportation status, like so many millions have been. She's just kind of living her life and uh, thought she was going through a routine thumbs up on getting together with her husband and uh, getting documentation, and she ended up in jail. She has been released, and she's on a temporary stay until May when this whole thing will have to be decided by ICE again. Uh, we're going to have them on the program in the near future. It seems to me, though, that this is, uh, I, I agree with the, the advocates that this seems to be arbitrary and uh, just puzzling. So stay tuned for that. We'll discuss it on the radio as well on WPR weekdays 3 till 6. In the meantime, uh, Ken Block is a participant in this particular conversation uh, that has drawn Walt Buteau's interest. Walt's been chronicling um, some oversight watchdog behavior by a gentleman by the name of Rob Cody, who's been a guest here in Warwick, who now has, I don't know, outed the fire department on some peculiar timesheet issues. Warwick firefighters are allowed unlimited shift changes under their current collective bargaining agreement. Critics claim shift changes allow firefighters to swap shifts with other firefighters instead of using vacation and sick time. That potentially increases the contracted end of year and end of career payouts for unused vacation and sick time. Rob Cody has publicly complained about this issue for years. What it does is allows a guy to monetize his vacation day or his sick day at a higher rate later on. Cody says he discovered 1,391 shift change forms are allegedly missing from the fire department. Then only days ago, Cody tells Target 12 he received a letter containing what the city confirms is a firefighter contract proposal. One suggestion would limit shift changes to one per person every two months. Included on the document addressed to Cody, a handwritten message. Thanks, you jerk. And on the next page, bigger jerk. What's wrong with it is... Ken Block helped Cody digitize and analyze 50 pounds of documents. He believes Cody has hit a nerve about an issue that over the past and future years, Block says is costing taxpayers millions of dollars. My professional opinion that there is absolutely a problem 
with ship manipulation in Warwick. Yes. A Warwick spokesperson tells Target 12 the release of that contract negotiation document is concerning, and she says the city is looking into it. So, welcome. Thank you. Your professional opinion as a... As a, a data analyst, somebody who looks at waste and fraud through data, mm. uh, there is ship manipulation happening in Warwick. Uh, and to try and put a little bit better explanation than what we heard on, on, on uh, the TV segment there, you have ship changes happening directly before and after two-week vacations. So what's happening is you have people extend, effectively extending their vacations, doing things like that. And when those shift changes ultimately allow a firefighter to, let's say, not use a sick day or a vacation day, they're able to then cash those sick days or vacation days in either at the end of the contract right, or at the end of their career when they retire. But in Warwick, they have a particularly nasty contract provision, nasty in my opinion, great for the firefighters, that says that once a firefighter banks 140 sick days, right, so you work seven years, get 20 days a year, you have and you don't take any sick days, you have 140 days in the bank. After you've done that, every sick day you don't use every year, you get paid out that year. So they started monetizing sick days as they went. So if you don't use your sick day, you get to cash that in, and it used to be at 50% of what they made, now it's at 75%. So uh, in the leaked contract that uh, was mailed to Rob, uh, the city of Warwick wants to do away with monetizing unused sick days uh, every year, and the projected cost savings is more than $5 million. Hmm. So, yeah, well, there's the one and a half percent that he's referring to. So what he's saying is, if you bank up those 140 days over the first seven years of your career, but you get them paid out at the end, they're not paid out at the, your earnings rate in your first seven years, they're all paid out at whatever your last salary oh, was. I see. So, and, and the salaries tend to go up dramatically in the last year of, of your career. So it's, uh, there, there's millions and millions and millions of dollars at stake, and I am a Warwick taxpayer, my businesses are there. So I, I really am, have a strong interest in seeing this worked out. Uh, I don't know that any other community in Rhode Island is as bad as Warwick is, because I'm not aware of any other provision where it's so many sick days can be monetized every year. Uh, you know, the other weird thing, I think you and I talked about this at one point, uh, even though firefighters get 20 sick days a year, on average, a Warwick firefighter only uses one of those days every year, yet they're given 20. It's, it's an out-of-control, really bad system. Well, the usage ought to determine what the contract offer is. Yeah. I mean, if you, uh, uh, all due respect to firefighters, this is where it gets sticky, because right. nobody wants to pick on firefighters. Right. They, they're lifesavers, and sometimes they use that to their own contractual advantage, and who can blame them? But I'm on the side. If I have data that says I've got an, an average one sick day per year, I offer them three. Right. Uh, we, we have to get, we've got the healthiest department in America. Listen, you need some TDI. I mean, whatever short-term, do they get TDI? Um, I don't think so. Yeah, so, so that's one of the things. That's why they get those those numbers of days, and they can bank them, and that, that it's generally the of course, public is Of course, if they're injured argue. on duty, yeah. they get state-mandated uh, sick days that come at no cost to them. So there's, there's, there's two different levels of sick days. There's the sick days the city of Warwick gives that are right. monetizable, but then state law says if you're mm. injured on the job, you get a sick day regardless. You think this, the, the, you're not the attorney general, but I guess the AG is looking into this. Is this criminal, do you think? Or is this just kind of an extension of an already customary practice? I'm aware of fire departments in other parts of the country where shift manipulation was going on that resulted in uh, payouts that shouldn't have been happening that was prosecuted as criminal. Hmm. Where's this going, do you know? I don't know, but the fact that the Warwick Fire Department was destroying records is a really big deal. And both the... Well, I, well the report, Walt reported them missing. I don't know that they're destroyed. Uh, Rob was told, and I think he has video or audio of a city council meeting where they said they were destroyed. For what purpose? I don't know. And are those the documents that would explain why Joe took over for Bill, who took over for Correct. Tim, that Correct. kind of thing? Yeah. Huh. It's not good. No, it's that's not, not good. good. All right, well, uh, interesting that you got involved in that. When we come back, I want to... Uh, uh, discuss a bunch of things that uh, Ken is involved in. In the meantime, let me just uh, come over here and tell you that 
the, the folks at Navigant Credit Union have the Card Valet app right in the palm of your hand. Uh, I know that's where your smartphone is, but this app is way more sophisticated than the average online banking exercise is. Uh, download the Card Valet app, uh, become a member at Navigant Credit Union, and you'll be able to see the wonder of it all right here in the palm of your hand. Card Valet and Navigant Credit Union. Right back, Ken's got a lot on his plate. Stay with us. All righty, uh, that is an, an excerpt from uh, a, a story in the Providence Journal, the political scene. I'm not sure unless you've got a 72-inch TV that you can read that, but I'll read it to you. Um, Ken Block is quoted in the Providence Journal saying, It's an election run amok. Uh, comments come after the state elections board turned down the challenge that candidate Mark Fecto, who is running for a vacated Pawtucket Senate seat, uh, posted to the validity of signatures on a Democratic primary opponent, David Norton's nominating petition. Um, Ken Block's issue, voting began before the campaigns got away. February 2nd was the deadline for challenges. The Pawtucket Canvassing Board effectively kicked Fecto's complaint to the Board of Elections since the race involves a legislative seat. The state board rejected his arguments on Wednesday night. Emergency mail ballot voting became the same, uh, began the same day. All right. <laughs> Did you get all that? Uh, translate? Yeah. Uh, two very interesting things are uh, running afoot right now in a special election in Pawtucket. The first one is this challenge of signatures, which happens every once in a while. As a candidate, you have to run around, collect 100 signatures for a Senate seat. As a governor candidate, you have to have 1,000 signatures. And sometimes campaigns will try and knock somebody out by challenging whether a signature is good or bad. So that happened last uh, Wednesday in Pawtucket. But, uh, uh, or at, at the Board of Elections for Pawtucket. But what was interesting about it was they held that challenge one day after voting had already begun in the town. So Pawtucket voting started Wednesday morning, and the Board of Elections heard a challenge to ballot access Wednesday night. Well, what if they had determined that this poor guy was no longer on the ballot? Do they take back the votes that were already cast? Right? Do they have to go out and reprint all the ballots that are already on the street? So, so hmm. that's a weirdness, right? Uh, but then what's really interesting about the Pawtucket race is that from when ballot access is settled... This is a special election. This is a yeah. special election to fill a Dan... Uh, 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 Doyle. uh, Senator Doyle Street... Right. Uh, he, uh, he left. He left. Claiming disability. Yeah, right. right. So, so uh, what's interesting about it is from the calendar of when the ballot should have been settled which is when the campaigns really start, because, you know, how can you campaign if you're not on the ballot? Uh, what they ended up learning here was, or I learned, was that the uh, day the ballot was settled was the day vo early voting started. So we have an election in Pawtucket that I call a zero-day election. No days to campaign and 20 days of early voting. That's what's happening in Pawtucket. And it's a problem for us because... We, and I call it early voting, it's called emergency balloting Who's by us? law. Who's us? So for all of Rhode Island, okay. the early voting is a, is a challenge for us because we have some of the shortest general elections in the whole country, right? Uh, our typical election in November is only a 56-day general election. It's 56 days from the end of the primary to our general election, and 20 of those days are spent on early voting. As a candidate, how can you effectively communicate to your voters if they're already voting and you haven't had a chance to talk to them yet, right? And for a, for a statewide early race, voting is is it mail a mail ballot voting, uh, absentee voting, or just we we, we have no early voting law in so, the state. Well, uh, the secretary of state uh, at that board of elections meeting I was at proposed three bills. One of which was to formalize right. early voting. And during her testimony, she actually said that. And let's call the emergency ballots what they are. It's early voting. Hmm. So she even admitted that those ballots are early voting, than, than they are. Uh, and they're being used in greater and greater numbers. Uh, 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 not this past election, but the election before, there were 20,000 uh, mail ballots slash early votes. And in, in, the, in 2016, there were 40,000 of them. Uh, so it's happening. It's being used. But the Pawtucket circumstance is like an absurd, uh, extreme 
uh, uh, end of what could happen. What could happen here? Because we have a, an election where the candidates had no time to get their message out before people started casting their ballot. So what that practically means is that people are voting and they don't even know who's running. What kind of an election are we having? Are people purposely taking those ballots out? Yes. Yes. And, and so they're taking it out with a perp. They're taking those ballots out. Generally, people who, who look for mail ballots um, generally have a purpose in mind, or a candidate in mind. Or what my experience is, is that campaigns more and more have to focus on putting those ballots in voters' hands. Right? The election has become less an art of my putting ideas into your head and telling, informing you about what I'm about to instead saying, fill out this ballot in my name, please. Right? That's what our elections are turning into, and with Pawtucket being an absurd example of, of how extreme this can be. And that's not what an election is about. Uh, elections need to be about candidates convincing voters to vote for them because of the quality of their ideas and what they represent, as opposed to scurrying around, filling out paper as fast as you can, because you have 20 days to win in an election where the whole thing will be determined so, based on how many slips of paper people fill so out. So tell me what the... Uh, you, you've had some success at the Board of Elections on a, on a bigger basis. Yes. On, on a, on a, uh, you had some language issues here. We got another headline that reflects this. Um, this was another long time coming, a yes. battle that you had at the Board. Yes. So uh, that battle was I, in reviewing Rhode Island's voter regu regulations, s found that the state was violating federal election law. The Help America Vote Act is federal law that says that, uh, in short, you have to collect social security numbers or driver's license numbers from people who registered to vote. Rhode Island was doing that, and then in 2008, the Board of Elections changed our regulations to say, in effect, you don't have to provide that information if you registered to vote in person. And that's just not supported by federal law in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it took the better part of, I think, five months. You know, I had a lot of rocks thrown at my head, but at the end of the day, uh, last Wednesday, the Board of Elections put, proposed a new set of rules where they remove that uh, exemption that wasn't there in federal law. So, I mean, just because you show up in person doesn't mean you can't be fraudulently representing who you are. Of course, but you know, look, and more importantly, Rhode Island has 143,000 voters in our voter registration database, people who cast ballots in 2016 who do not have Social Security numbers or driver's licenses in the database. Now, that's bad, right, because how, if we don't know specifically who they are by that data, we can't identify them. And there's a, there's a bill in the House right now to remove voter identification. They want to undo the law that was passed in 2012, where the day you vote, you have to show your driver's license to cast a ballot. If they remove voter ID, we now have 143,000 people who will vote and we have no way to confirm either with their registration data or when they show up in person that they are who they say they are. Now, one of my dream shows, so I say that kind of tongue in cheek, is Ken and the Secretary of State having a conversation. About I'm happy issues. to do this anytime. I know, I, I, I'm well aware that you are. I'm not so sure that Nelly is. When we come back, the line item veto, is this the year? I don't know. All right. Uh, well, that's a different kind of voting. Uh, we're, this uh, we were already on the, uh, my bad to authorize that video. We've already used that video. We're on another subject here, and it's called light item veto, and it's about the governor being able to redline any governor being able to redline items in the budget uh, in order to take them out without having to vote against the entire or, or veto the entire budget if there are things in there that are uh, just you know, things that she or he disagree with. Correct. You've been battling on this. Some 44 states in the country have line item veto. Correct. Uh, the governor, in her typical fashion, has argued for it in second gear. I think that gearing has gone up. Okay. I would say that we're in third gear transitioning to fourth gear. Meaning she's getting active on it. I believe you're going to see some action happening. Uh, the Senate. You agree with me that she has been in second gear for quite some time. <laughs> yeah, but prior to this year, it hasn't been a priority. But look, this is an election year. Uh, the Senate has unanimously sponsored every member of the Senate, every sitting member of the Senate, has co-sponsored the light item veto bill that the governor put in to that chamber, uh, and the speaker has sponsored the line item veto bill in the House. 
and we're getting co-sponsors onto that every day now. So the we're, speaker we're, sponsored the line item veto in the House. He did at the request that's, that's, of the governor. That's a study commission. No, no, the actual bill. Since when? He actually sponsored it last year too. I don't think. I don't no, think no, the speaker doesn't want the line item veto. No, no, but he sponsored it. It is. He was. On, he's on that bill as the prime sponsor in both years. The last time I talked to him about the line item veto, he was saying that he wanted a commission. And he wants a commission, and there is a commission. But he's also the sponsor of the governor's bill. Well, has the commission done any work? Uh, they had an organizational meeting. So Who far. are they? How many people? What kind of people? Uh, there are, I think it's 11, uh, six of whom were identified by the speaker and five of whom were identified by the Senate president. It's a little bit stacked. <laughs> they don't want the line on a veto. They don't, but... Uh, and of course, we the know power we, goes we know. Away from the legislature we, of with course, the line we, we understand that. But there, this is a political and becoming a hotter political potato as time goes on. Uh, there's an election this fall, and uh, the voting public uh, supports the line item veto by vast numbers. No doubt. Uh, so we're getting ready to apply a lot of pressure on the line item veto, uh, and I'm happy to say today, for the first time that a majority of General Assembly members, so I, well, there's 113 senators and reps all together, 57 of them now are officially uh, as uh, supporting the line item veto. Uh, That's of your whom, head count? Uh, of whom 20 are in the House. So we so need... 37 we, in the Senate, 20 in the House. Yeah, and we need another 17, 18. We need another 18 in the House and we have a majority. We're actually not that far away. And, and we're just starting to ramp up the pressure. So, you know, this is the year. With, with, with an election coming, with the right amount of pressure, uh, I think we actually can get there. And look, this is the same travel that the master lever had. It took a couple of years of building the Something public support. Something else you and others, uh, that uh, you were a key, a key right? advocate and, and, and you a key line on a veto. It, it, it's, it's about building the pressure and waiting for the politically opportune moment, right? And it happened, so happened that in 2014, <coughs> we had an election, we had Speaker Fox go to jail, Boom, we got the master lever. Uh, this year, we have a speaker who's been weakened by a challenge in 2016, and he's trying to hold control of the chamber. We have an election coming down the line, and we're going to have increasing pressure to get a reform. And here's the thing. We're not asking him to do something that most of the rest of the country is not doing. We're asking him to do something that almost everybody else is already well, doing. I mean, he's always talking about the culture of financial hawkishness in the House, meaning that's where... That's where a lot of, uh, listen, the governor supplies a budget and does a big speech, and after that, she's kind of on the sidelines, more or less waiting. He's always yeah. been uh, proud and defensive over the House being in the driver's seat. Do you think you're going to get a vote on this on the floor this year? That's what we're going to push really hard for. It's well, with that kind of, uh, with that kind of voting um, number out there, it's hard to suppress that in committee. The, well, let me ask you this. Yeah. I only got about, uh, 30 sure. seconds here. How do, how do you document this headcount? So I have the email communications with every rep uh, who and has they they told would me vote for that it. they said they would vote for it. Is there different, is, is, there's a difference between I'd vote for it if it comes to the floor and fighting for it to come to the floor. Ten the, seconds. No, there's no question. This is all about pressure. We're going to keep applying the pressure, and it's going to be full court. There you go. A lot of work done. Be right back. Issues of Education, be here tomorrow night, and we'll see you on the radio at 3 on WPRO. Thanks for watching. Good night.